right. Okay, so why don't we continue with uh, uh, MR of the knee, and we're, we're uh, talking now, talk a little bit about anatomic variants. We'll talk about ossicles around the knee, some muscle variants, uh, an anterior compartment, and, uh, and some of the menisci. So why don't we start here, uh, Ilior. Uh, so what do you see here? So we see an axial T2 of the knee. I'm seeing lateral subluxation of the patella. I'm seeing... Maybe a little bit. We'd have to see more. Certainly there's a progression here. There's a lot of degenerative disease of the uh, patella femoral joint, grade 4 chondromalacia, large osteophytes, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, a little bit of fusion here. Uh, the, the, the main thing I want to pick out here is kind of variance, and that is the large amount of subcutaneous fat. Okay. Here. And uh, I'm going to give kind of a talk about this later, and I know it's not a PC right now to talk about obesity. Uh, that's considered a no-no. But in the musculoskeletal system, obesity is really highly correlated with a lot of the disease that we see, especially in weight-bearing joints like the foot and ankle and the knee. Uh, so I, I personally, uh, I, I really believe that uh, uh, every MR scan of the of the musculoskeletal decision should comment about the muscle integrity and and, and the fat. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was actually uh, uh, an article from England where they asked referring physicians and patients about that, and there was pretty much general agreement that that was a good idea, both from patients and and physicians. Uh, but that's rare in radiology, and I think a lot of radiologists are afraid to offend the referring physician or patients. But as we'll talk about in a future lecture, uh, 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 increased subcutaneous fat is highly associated, much more so than a lot of the other findings that we see on MR examination with uh, uh, pathology in the musculoskeletal system. So I just want to bring this up, and we'll talk about it more. Okay, uh, Robert, what do you th what do you see here? All right, so we got, looks like a coronal and sagittal uh, T1 of the knee. And it looks like there's an accessory ossicle, which would be a uh, fabella. Okay, good. And so the fabella, which we see here, which we very commonly see, is actually in the lateral head of the gastrocnemius tendon. And, and that's a fabella here. And it's a normal finding, and most of us don't even look at it. And, and uh, we... I generally don't comment it on it on the report. Okay, so that's a fabella, very common location. Okay, so. All right, we have a coronal and sagittal T2 images of the knee with a, another accessory ossicle, kind of more inferior than that uh we typically see the fabella okay. at, right the fabella was on the medial side yeah right? oh so this is on the so lateral oh so that's lateral side i'm sorry they're both on the lateral side sorry oops uh the 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 the, the question is what tendon is this at uh you see the fibers are kind of going obliquely here it's like a pop please and so oh no it's There we go. Uh, so this is actually in the popliteus tendon coming across here. And that ossicle of the popliteus tendon is called cymella. Okay. Again, it's considered a normal variant, but a lot of these normal variants, as we'll talk about later, uh, are not so normal. And, and this particular one is rare. And uh, as we'll show uh, in further uh, talks, in certain locations, like the distal long, uh, 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 perineal uh, tendons, the, uh, uh, a lot of these are due to prior partial tears, where you get hemorrhage into the tendon, you get a little hematoma, and that then ossifies over time. And it's really uh, often a signature of uh, prior injury. But And we'll go through a number of areas in the body where that's the case. 
also the ulnar collateral ligament of the elbow. About 17% of Major League Baseball pitchers will have ossicles in the ulnar collateral ligament, and virtually nobody else in the regular population does. And that's because it's an area of repetitive trauma if you're a Major League Baseball pitcher. But we'll have a lot of talks. Well, Dr. Bella, John, um, isn't it a bit higher than, than what we're looking at here? Yes, that's correct. This is down near the meniscus. And as you can see a little bit here, this is the popliteus muscle, and that's the popliteus tendon. And it's more inferior, and it's more laterally positioned. Whereas and these, the, are, the, the these are not that common, are they? These are quite rare, right. But they're generally considered normal variants. But these, if I do uh, notice it, I will comment on uh, uh, Simellus. Mm -hmm. And there's another variant here called the gastrocnemius tercius muscle. It's one of the more common <laughs> variants uh, around the knee when it comes to muscles. And here we can see this is normal anatomy on the left side. And this shows a a gastrocnemius tercius tendon on the right side, which is back here. There are actually two variants that can present in this same location. But for the gastrocnemius tercius, we can see how this tendon really comes off uh, the gastrocnemius muscle here and then attaches. And uh, uh, let's see, this is a uh, 20 year old with discomfort and has posterior knee swelling. This is a, an ultrasound. Mm, okay, so we see posterior knee, I suppose, just muscle fibers. Yeah. So, so this shows why it's frustrating to do ultrasound of the musculoskeletal system by teleradiology, because you don't know where the hell you are here. Uh, if we go to an MR examination, uh, this area is this area on the ultrasound. So what are we dealing with here? Uh, it, it looks like an accessory muscle. Yeah, so you, we normally don't have a muscle in that location. And there we can see it kind of uh, colored here uh, in this. And if we go to the axial images, this is the muscle that we're talking about, uh, where we have here. And uh, this is a, this can be a uh, in a location where you might get an accessory gastrocnemius, but if you follow this up, uh, which we can't always do with MR because we don't go proximally enough, this actually doesn't go to the gastrocnemius, and this goes to the tensor fascial, uh, and this is uh, called a tensor fasci soralis muscle back in this location. The important thing is just to recognize these, uh, and you can, if you look at it carefully, it has the same tissue characteristics as muscle, same intensity, same little fat within it. Uh, so this looks like normal muscle. It's just in an abnormal location. Because uh, uh, we commonly image patients who have masses, palpable masses, and it's very important to differentiate uh, normal uh, uh, patho well, pathologic from normal variants. Is it is it more likely that one is like embedded into the posterior fascia right there? Yes. To help uh, differentiate and how it's... Uh... Yeah, so you can come down into the fascia here. Okay, uh, Robert? Let's see. Um, so we have uh, sagittal and coronal of the knee. Uh, this looks sort of similar to the last case. It looks like there's maybe an accessory muscle back there. There's something coming down here. It's a little hard to say whether it's coming off the gastrocnemius or not. And it looks like it's kind of coming down here into the fascia. And we see a little bit of fatty atrophy within it. And this is the one in the fascia salatus muscle. Okay. Jason? All right. We have a uh, sagittal T2 image of the. I'm oh, sorry. Is T2 could be T1 of the knee and that's a T2 sagittal. Okay. Um, there is something posterior to the distal femur. Yeah. 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 Okay. So there is kind of a mass back there. This kind of looks like it might be tendon. This looks a lot like muscle. So I would be 
concern. This doesn't have a typical appearance of a malignant type lesion from its signal characteristics. So I'd be concerned about it possibly being a variant. We go to other images. Here are the coronal images. And here are axial images. And axial images. So that kind of oblong uh, muscle on the axial slice is our accessory one. I, I don't know what okay, so variant it is, though. So, yeah. like muscle. And here it's coming around. And it's attached. It looks like it's attaching here to the femur, right? Yeah. And this was a gastrocnemia variant, of which uh, there there are kind of four described types, but we don't need to go through them. And the important thing is to to kind of recognize that this really doesn't look like a malignant lesion. The margins are very sharp. It's fairly elongated. It's not spherical. It has signal characteristics that look just like muscle. So you, you should be concerned about this being a normal variant and not a malignant lesion. So something like this would... I think it's, excuse me, John, I think it's a good idea to let the surgeon know that it's there uh, if they're operating in posterior aspects of the knee. Good um, point, John. Very good. Thank you. Or has, is there any... Well, it's anything that would compromise like these adjacent nerves since they, they yeah. run in close approximation? Yeah. Okay. You're, you're premature here. Help Remember, you. orthopedic surgeons are not, a, a, they're, they're carpenters. They're, they're, they're not uh, brainiacs. Yeah, I'm not sure that's true, John, but... We're, we're not, uh, we're not neurosurgeon. <laughs> okay. All right. Elior, what do you think is going on here? So we have an uh, angiogram of the lower extremity. We see, uh, yeah, the superficial uh, femoral artery just looks like there's an occlusion. Okay. And then here's the venous return. What do you see here? Uh, I mean, there's some outpouching there of that yeah, of that like vein. Maybe a little displacement of the vein here in this okay. location. I'd be kind of concerned that there's a mass here, right? Mm. So here's an MR scan. Now I'm going to show a video right. in a minute. We may have to go through it a couple of times, but here are the gastrocnemius muscles, and it's odd. There's a big one right here in the middle, mm -hmm. and we have the uh, medial and the lateral over here. Uh, but we're going to be looking at the popliteus artery here. Uh, uh, and uh, as what this is a case where a normal variant anatomy of the gastrocnemius is actually uh, entrapping uh, the popliteal artery. So here's a video. Try to look here at the artery. And notice if you look here, there's the artery. Here's the artery. Notice how it gets pinched right there between. Yeah. And, the, and the question is. If software has changed, so I've got to figure out how to stop it. There we go. So if you look at it, there's the artery. It's coming down, mm -hmm. and right here it's getting pinched mm -hmm. between an abnormal or a variant uh, a, a gastrocnemius muscle in the midline and the medial, posterior medial femoral apicondyle, mm -hmm. back there, condyle. So that's the that's where it's being compressed by this abnormal muscle right here. This is the abnormal variant muscle. Mm -hmm. So if we go back here, this is the abnormal muscle that shouldn't be there, which is compressing uh, the the artery. So that's that's called uh, femoral artery entrapment. Okay. Okay. Next case. So we got a 66-year-old female with increasing pain over six months. We got a couple of sagittal uh, images of the knee. Uh, so this is pain over six months. This is not quite a normal variant, but it's pathology that we have to be aware of. So if you have increasing leg pain, what kind of things do you think about? Are you thinking like a blood clot? Okay, that's something. So we look back here, the, we're supposed to yourself, uh, here are the vessels back here, there's this mm -hmm. black thing here. 
go to the axial images, this is above it, and this is at the level of that black thing. So what do you think is happening? It's uh, uh, a blood clot. In the... right. And then what you can see, there's a, another variant of the gastrocnemius mm -hmm. here, which could be uh, compressing against the uh, uh, popliteal artery, mm -hmm. and that caused compression and clot formation within the artery. Okay, and then we can, we need to talk about synovial plica. This was a big issue 20, 30 years ago. It's kind of an issue that you don't really hear about anymore, uh, but we'll talk about it. So plica are fibrous bands uh, inside the joint space. Uh, they, uh, the joint space within the knee Embry embryologically starts out as three separate compartments, a medial compartment, a lateral compartment, and a suprapatellar compartment. Uh, they grow together, and then the, uh, the walls tend to get resorbed uh, where they meet each other, and you end up with one compartment. But uh, those walls may not completely resorb, and you may be left with fibrous bands uh, between the, the different compartments. And that's thought to be the primary etiology of uh, synovial plica. <laughs> and uh, classic ones are suprapatellar super plica, medial plica, and infrapatellar plica. So, next. All right. Please. So, these are coronal images, maybe a star on the left and a... Yeah, it's a pity it's out. out on the left, and and then uh, I, I think this I think it's the same other thing. Yeah, pity fat set just more. So know. there's uh this uh area of a uh, high signal in the medial compartment. Well, this is these are the femoral condyles. Oh. This is anterior and superior. So this is the the anterior compartment. Anterior right? compartment. Okay. And then here we can see that there looks like there's something separating. A pouch above it and below it, and we see a lot of the junk yeah. inside the, one of the compartments there. Here are the post-contrast images. Okay, so there's a uh, low-intensity collection that has peripheral enhancement. Okay, so the collection is peripheral enhancement. If the patient looked like they were in septic shock, you'd be worried about an abscess, but this patient wasn't. They just had pain up here. So uh, no there's what the ultrasound shows, uh, and uh, here's the axial uh, MR scan, PD fat set MR scan, and right basically the same area as the axial uh, ultrasound on the other side, and we can see all this thickened stuff here, uh, there, and and this was a complete superior plica, so they ended up with two anterior compartments. They did not communicate with each other, and one of them tends to get walled off and often can become uh, thickened like this. You can get some inflammatory changes within it, and it can become painful. Uh, this is really quite uncommon. Uh, it's thought that this complete plica may be an incomplete plica uh, early on unless it's in a child, uh, but uh, if you get trauma, you can cause inflammatory changes which may seal it off, producing a, uh, a an isolated pouch. And this was a, an article from a number of years ago which looked at superior plica and basically divided them into kind of a, 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 com, a complete and then uh, 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 this is kind of a longitudinal separating the two. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I don't really use that. Um, okay, so so that was a complete plica uh, in the suprapatellar space. Here is a 24-year-old male with knee pain. Yeah, we see an axial, um, maybe PD fat sat, maybe an arthrogram. Um, I see a dark uh, linear low signal band in the medial, like right. medial to the patella. Yeah, so this is nice and thin. It's on the medial side. And if you look carefully, you'll see these in most patients. And there we go. And uh, here, if we follow it down, 
Uh, this actually goes down and you can see it adjacent to the bone. This can actually produce rubbing uh, the uh, uh, trochlear medial, the medial side of the trochlea here, and can produce chondromalacia in that location, which may be symptomatic. Uh, and, but it's, it's uncommon. At one time, this was thought to be more common. This is commonly seen in the early days of arthroscopy, uh, where they generally resected them because they thought they could produce symptoms from rubbing on the bone there. Uh, here's a sagittal images where you can see that medial plica. And again, if you look at it, you'll see it all the time. John, do you want to talk a little bit about medial plica in well, the orthopedic I, world? The, the medial plica is, uh, always, has been confused in the past before MRI um, uh, with a torn medial meniscus because the symptoms are very similar. You get um, giving way of the knee, you get clicking, um, you get pain, um, uh, especially after an injury. Usually these are um, benign in terms of um, discomfort or any disability, but if you bruise the knee and the patella um, pinches this against the femur, uh, it becomes symptomatic and, and can get uh, larger in size and scarred, etc. Uh, if that happens, then the treatment initially um, after an injury like this is a, putting a patient in a brace. And ordinarily, a brace will take care of the problem and the symptoms will go away and things will go back to what they were before. However, in some individuals, if you have a severe enough injury and scarring, uh, it'll be a um, repetitive problem. If it becomes a repetitive problem, then you have to do surgical procedures. But uh, I cannot tell you how many menisci were removed because of a plica that wasn't seen um, prior to MRI. Thank you. Thank you, John. And, and after the MRI, uh, unfortunately, normal um, plicas that did not cause any problems, some other things caused symptomatic uh, processes uh, were removed, and there was a fee of some 800 bucks uh, to remove one, uh, which is very easy to do, but they scar afterwards and can be a problem. Uh, in that way, but uh, uh, a surgeon, uh, an orthopedic surgeon needs to operate on a patient arthroscopically and uh, don't find anything. Uh, that, that's just an arthroscopic uh, procedure, which is very uh, uncommon today because of MRI and, and uh, a more uh, uh, stringent rules. Um, in my years of practice, I always insisted that a pathological specimen would go to pathology. Uh, I got outvoted uh, in a surgical committee once um, because I insisted that uh, uh, tears and menisci that were removed should be in the pathology lab because, uh, because of uh, um, basically cheating. Thanks, John. Okay. Robert? All right. Uh, so, knee pain. So we have knee pain. We have uh, coronal and sagittal. Looks like a T1, T2. Um, looks like there's a band of what, like fibrous tissue down there, yeah. And this and that. So, what are these? So, would that be an inferior plica? So, this and that. So, is that an inferior plica? Yeah. So, so this is called an infrapatellar plica. Now, actually, in this location, there are a number of structures that have different names that all may be the same thing. Uh, uh, which which can can occasionally cause problems, uh, but uh, 
generally they don't cause problems and they just need to be recognized for what they are. So this is kind of an infrapatellar plica uh, in this particular case. And this was that surgery was fibrous tissue compatible with a plica. Uh, here's a case from France. What do you think about this one, Jason? So this is a PD fat sat sagittal view of the knee. I see a thin band of uh, low signal anterior to the distal femur, kind of wedged between the to distal femur up in there. Is it maybe that's his uh, volume? Yeah. What do you think this is? On first look, I would assume it's the ACL. Okay, but then what do you think this is? Yeah, see, that doesn't it doesn't add up. So it's probably a... now there are two bands of the ACL that we'll talk about. Yeah, and so this could be the anterior medial band. This could be the posterior lateral band. Uh, but uh, you shouldn't have doesn't fluid really, going that, straight through. Yeah. Like if we go to the axial images, we can see two different structures there. Uh, this this is uh, off to the side on fat suppressed images. And here you can see this is the ACL. This is that other structure coming to something here. Looks like it joins with the yeah. meniscal, meniscal ligament. Well, this is considered a normal anatomic variant. It's called an anomalous insertion of the medial meniscus, a name that to me doesn't make a lot of sense. But here is the medial, the anterior horn of the medial meniscus. It's a fibrous band that goes from the anterior horn of the medial meniscus anterior and medial to the ACL up to the origin of the ACL. Uh, this also has several other names, but it's considered a, a normal variant and generally is not a surgical lesion and is not thought to produce symptoms. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> okay so 15-year-old male with chronic knee pain um okay we have axial and sagittal uh t2s i see just looking at the pcl um it's kind of a structure curving <laughs> curving down and attaching to the tibia are you talking um, about this no uh more inferiorly that this no down here no uh, like from the from the pcl over here yes and then coming anteriorly it looks like there's something that that yeah this yes okay so we'll see this this is called humphrey's ligament but we'll talk about that later okay another normal variant now what i'm concerned about here is this structure coming down here Okay. which is similar to what we saw before. And if you look on the axial images, you don't really see the typical ACL very well because we've got this anterior structure that's that's uh, getting rid of the fat that we have there. And notice it goes to this little structure that we saw in the previous case, which goes into a fibrous structure and the Hoffa's fat pad. And there we can, we can see the, the structure. And here it kind of comes down here coming over toward the anterior horn of the medial meniscus. And if you follow it on the coronal images, there's the next cut, there's the next cut, and there's the next cut all the way into the anterior horn of the medial meniscus. Uh, again, this is a normal variant, and is that uh, this is also called the anterior medial meniscal femoral ligament. I think all three of these things are really basically the same thing anterior inferior, uh, anterior medial meniscal femoral ligament, oops, the anomalous insertion of the medial meniscus, and the infrapatellar plica. Uh, and the infrapatellar plica, typically you talk about it if it's more involving the uh, Hoffa's fat pad, you can often get a more thickened fibrous band in Hoffa's fat pad. That's typically what people call infrapatellar plica. And then these other structures anterior to the ACL, which often come down, and if you look carefully, make may insert on the anterior horn of the medial meniscus, or uh, 
there's the anterior medial meniscal, anterior medial meniscal femoral ligament. The bottom line is that these are considered normal variants and not pathologic. Okay, so now let's talk about meniscal variants. Uh, and uh, the discoid you all know about, and you probably know that it's divided into three types, a complete type, an incomplete type, and one is called a Risberg variant, where you have no meniscotibial or coronary ligaments posteriorly, or oral popliteal meniscal fascicles, and the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus is stable, stabilized by Humphreys or Risberg's ligament that we're going to talk about. And then finally, you've got a, a ring meniscus. Now, I think that type 3 may well be, some of them may be congenital. I think a lot of them are patients who have previous posterior root attachment tears that uh, may not have been detected, uh, but, uh, but we'll talk about that. Let's see, who's next? Robert, are you next? Uh, I used to see this in infants uh, whose knees, when they flex, produce a pop. Yeah. And uh, uh, we knew that that, that was a... Uh, That's congenital, yeah. Congenital, not traumatic. Yeah. Uh, the youngest one that was operated on that I know of was like uh, two weeks old or less. Because every time the baby um, flexed the knee, um, it cried, and uh, both knees had the problem, and and uh, they had to wait a little bit until the infant got a little older before operating. But it was very difficult for the mother to take care of the baby because of the cr chronic crying. Wow, thanks, John. And uh, that was before arthroscopy, actually, which is so how we had to open the knee. Hey, Robert, 57-year-old female. All right, so we got coronal fat set on the left and T2 on the right. Looks like there's a, a I guess, T2 or hypo-intense uh, band, like on the medial intercondylar notch. Uh, so looks like it keeps... So these are the coronals. So it looks like it goes down to the anterior horn of the medial meniscus. Mm -hmm. Here are the sagittal images. So this looks different from the last one we saw, right? Right. But notice how sh black it is, mm -hmm. how sharp the margins are. Mm -hmm. This looks like it's a structure that was made there. Yeah. So what is this? Would this More images? Where would this be coming back here? Would this be like a menisco menisco ligament? So this is a menisco menisco ligament, and it connects the anterior horns of uh, this one's meniscus. It connects the anterior horns and posterior horns of the same meniscus. Another name for this, which we'll see in a minute, is a ring meniscus. It's a it's usually use a ring meniscus when it's larger than this and looks like it's part of the meniscus and is triangular. Uh, and you have to differentiate that an older individual. Or, uh, most people we look at uh, just to separate that from a uh, from a bucket handle tear which we'll talk about. Okay, so 12-year-old male, no injury, knee gives way. We have uh, several sagittal cuts of uh, the knee. Which that, compartment? Of the lateral um, compartment. Okay, so... Here's lateral, here's where uh, laterally, kind of getting toward the middle part, getting closer to the notch of the knee. If we continue going forward, this is what we see. Let's do that again. Laterally, kind of mid-substance of the meniscus, getting close to the notch of the knee. Here we're getting closer, and here we're in the notch of the knee. Yeah, so it seems like we get the bow tie uh, back, right? So there's a little bit too much uh, meniscal tissue more centrally. Okay, that's what it looks like. If we should go to a coronal here. 
Here are the coronal images. It looks like Here's the anteriorly, where the anterior meniscotibial attachment. Going back posteriorly, we see the anterior horn and body. And if we keep going back, here we can see the body. And we still have this structure here that's triangular and goes all the way back to the posterior root attachment of the lateral meniscus. So what is this? Um, another meniscal meniscal ligament. So you could uh, call it a meniscal meniscal ligament, but here it looks kind of triangular, like kind of a normal meniscus. So most people call this a ring meniscus. Okay. So it's really a meniscus. It's the same thing as a meniscal meniscal ligament, except it's a little bit larger and it looks more triangular, like you'd expect uh, the meniscus to look. But notice on if you look at the body here, it's nice and has a sharp normal free edge. Whereas if you had a bucket handle tear, you'd have a vertical tear here. This would displace and be, you'd be left with a truncated body of the lateral meniscus. So this is a normal variant ring meniscus. Okay. It's, a, it's a, just a different variant of a discoid meniscus. Uh, we, we didn't uh, try to uh, determine or, or give names to the different uh, menisci, uh, either we said either complete or incomplete uh, menis uh, discoid meniscus. Complete uh, covers the entire um, tibial plateau on the lateral side, um, and sometimes medially, um, or uh, incomplete. Uh, we we didn't go with the what now we, I, I I think it was after our uh, okay. it was many many years ago that I I did a five papers on the subject uh, every year we try to increase our numbers and we probably had the largest series uh, any place on in the literature. Thanks, John. Okay, so we got. 29 month female bilateral infantile tibia vera. We have uh, radiographs. Um, there's uh, maybe the findings, the, just prominence of that uh, medial aspect of the tibial plateaus. Like peaking here, the medial tibial plateaus on both sides, mm -hmm. symmetric. Here's what the MR scan looks like. Uh, I mean, there's increased signal in that area. I mean, could it be? Okay. So here, this is really the medial epiphysis, and it really mm -hmm. kind of goes through the growth plate into the metaphysis, and mm -hmm. is associated with this hypertrophic bone formation, mm -hmm. causing the the beaking on both sides. That's a pretty fat set. Here's the T1 weighted image, and this looks a lot like cartilage, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On both sides, it is symmetric. Okay, uh, do you know the name of this? Uh, yeah, Blount's. Okay, so this is Blount's disease. It's also called osteochondrosis deformans tibia. Uh, thought to be a local disturbance uh, in, in the epiphysis there. Uh, now, the, the main thing here is that if this occurs in infants from one to three, this is really normal, and it almost always resolves and gets better. So. Uh, then you have adolescence from 8 to 15 years, and the late onset is after 6 years, and, and that's where you get more concerned. So uh, uh, also the other thing that you have to be concerned about is if it's unilateral. If it's bilateral and it's less 3 years or less, then it's something that most people are going to grow out of. Uh, uh, and, and occasionally unilateral it can be as well, but you're more concerned about unilateral. Once you get into six to eight years old or older, then uh, it's uh, it's more of a pathologic situation. Yeah, usually the blounds that I I've seen many blounds cases, and uh, usually it's a, a single extremity uh, if it's blounds, and and you, you, you see one leg that looks quite normal, the other one is bold. Um, and, and then that's when you start suspecting that it's a blunt disease. And uh, you try to treat these early 
and wind up usually uh, with uh, three or four operations before the patient grows up. We do osteotomies, taking wedges out and putting them in, et cetera, to try to straighten the extremity. Uh, and usually you may wind up with a longer extremity because of all the surgery you do, which stimulates uh, growth. Uh, it's uh, not a fun disease to deal with for the patient or the or, or the doctor. It's uh, it's time consuming and it's uh, and it's a pretty much of a guessing game in terms of growth. Yeah, the other thing that you you have to think about is you've got to make sure there's not infection, trauma, AVN, or rickets. Is the kind of the difference you have to look at? Yeah, they, 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 they appear different even on X-ray, so you, you usually don't yeah don't screw up the diagnosis on these. Okay, and if it's late onset, it's often associated with obesity. And this could also be graded, though I've never heard of anyone who uses this classification. Okay. And on the MR scan, uh, you just see the cartilage extending into the metaphysis. Sometimes you can end up with body bridging, which can cause uh, deformities. Okay. And here are just some other examples of uh, Blount's disease, what it can look like on an MR examination, depending upon the degree of deformity. And there are many different procedures that are used for this condition. Uh, um, basically, what, what, what I'm talking about is uh, a trial in different procedures. Um, but, but ordinarily, it's, a, it's an osteotomy, just cutting the proximal tibia and taking a wedge out or put a wedge in. Uh, uh, there, there are other procedures, but... Uh, I, I I never fooled around with them because you screw up the, the normal vices and that's that's a no no. Okay, good. All right, so we got a ten year old male. Uh, some radiographs of the knee on the left, and then MR on the uh, right there. Uh, some irregularity of the femoral condyles. Uh, looks like. Yeah. Okay, so this involves multiple epiphyses, and you've got a lot of irregularity that you're showing abnormal growth. Mm -hmm. and this is uh, typically what you see in multiple epiphyseal dysplasia. Got it. So it's dysplastic and uh, multiple involved. It's usually due to my problem. This like is, is due to numerous, well, a lot of these diagnoses that were made in the past, like this in congenital syndromes, uh, we now know are due to a whole host of different congenital uh, 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 genetic variations. Uh, so they're not really one disease, they're multiple diseases now. And uh, we'll go through a number of these in the course of the year where Every month or two, there are uh, other genes that are shown to be associated with these. So there may be multiple genes that tend to affect the growth in similar ways, but the underlying genetic defect is different. And eventually, hopefully, we'll understand that, be able to uh, do genetic analysis and do specific treatment for each of them. And those treatments will probably all be different because they'll be uh, uh, biochemical treatments uh, <clears throat> rather than uh, one treatment fits all like we've done in the past. Uh, usually, uh, uh, the pathology is not only in the knee, so um, what you should recommend to the orthopedic surgeon uh, to do uh, a body scan. Uh, because a, a lot of these are uh, syndromes of one kind or another. Right. 
Okay, what do you think here? Yes. All right, we have a 14 year old boy who's an American football player. We have fluid sensitive fat set and T2 sagittal images of the knee in the medial compartment. <clears throat> There is some low signal extending into the posterior aspect of that epiphysis. Uh, okay, so what is that? Uh, where is it coming? I am not sure. I know that there's a lot of soft tissue thickening. Yeah. There. So, what do you think happened to this patient? Have any idea? What what covers the, the cortical bone in this area? Good. Unless there's a lot of hemorrhage down in through here. Yeah, is it like a popliteus? Uh... Yeah. This is uh, called periosteal entrapment. And we you'll see this this year at some point. But what they happened is they got a fracture that goes through the growth plate. It opened up the growth plate. It tore the periosteum here. Periosteum flipped back and it flipped into the growth plate area. So this yeah, it sucks, sucks it in. Sucks it in. Mm -hmm. And then it closes. And so there's been a controversy as to how to treat these. A couple of years ago, uh, we were discussing this. And John, what are your thoughts about how to treat this? Well, I, I always thought that the best thing to do is to watch it and um, I'll get an MRI maybe in six months or, or or three months intervals and see what happens, uh, because you can always um, remove a, a, a bar if it de develops in the area. In other words, the uh, physis fuses, but uh, to operate on it. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I I would be very reluctant. I never seen a case, but uh, I I would watch it for a while. And if I s saw that there was a fusion going on in the area, obviously I would remove it. So so we said this, and there are a number of papers now that have come out showing that it's best to just leave these in place. Uh, that. Uh, in order to get this out, you kind of have to kind of re-tear the growth plate, and that's traumatic, and that's thought to uh, be an increased risk. Uh, we've seen a few of these, though I've never really gotten any follow-up on them, but I certainly haven't heard any bad things about them. Uh, but I'd give a lecture like uh, this same lecture a few years ago, and uh, an orthopedic surgeon somewhere in Southeast Asia saw it and uh, vehemently disagreed with us and sent me an email saying that I needed to correct that. So, uh, uh, but, but I've seen more and more papers suggesting that this is kind of a leave me alone lesion, but it is somewhat controversial. Well, that, that's my opinion too. also. Yeah. Okay. Okay, 11 year old female, two weeks post injury, um, coronal, uh, PD fat set on the left. Yeah, that's a we, ideal. So this is kind of a PD fat set, and this is a PD on the right, kind of like a PD, but these are ideal sequences, so it's a little bit different, but they're essentially PD fat set and PD. Mm -hmm. So the fluid's a little bit brighter than a normal PD on this technique. So what do you think? Uh, so we see increased signal in the uh, tibial epiphysis, yeah. With this technique, you get two other images for free. One is a fat image that shows you where the fat is, and notice we've lost fat signal in the center here. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this was more of a PD fat set type image. That I mean, that's a water image, and this is a kind of a fat set image showing that you have a lot of edema uh, centrally here and a little bit of edema over there. And here are the sagittal images. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, maybe uh, PD on the left. Maybe, right. 
Maybe on the left and a T2 tube on the right, which mm -hmm. is a 3D technique. Yes. And here's what you see as a fractional mm -hmm. here. So what is this? This would be a, like the Salter Harris? Salter. Salter 4. Right. So that's a Salter 4 because it goes through both the epiphysis as well as the metaphysis mm -hmm. and along the growth plate here. So that's a Salter 4. We'll talk more about the details of Salter Harris lesion so we get provoked by Okay. All right. All right. So we got uh, sagittal. Uh, and a uh, corona of the okay. knee. Let, let me skip this one. Let's, okay. just, um, let's go to this one. All right. So we're going to have a coronal or two coronals of the knee and a 44-year-old worker who unexpectedly stumbled and twisted his knee in extension. Uh, it looks like there's edema in the lateral femoral condyle. So this is February 13th, 2013. Mm -hmm. And you see the femur there, and that's right where the lateral, lateral ligament attaches. Correct. And that goes along with the twisting kind of injury that he had on the job. And he has a MCL tear over mm -hmm. here, so it's a valgus twisting kind of injury is the mechanism. And I bring this up because what we see here, this is that little subchondral fracture that we see right right next to the articular cartilage of the posterior uh, lateral, the far posterior lateral femoral condyle, which we see there. This is on 2.13.13. Uh, and here you can see on the sagittal images all the bone edema there, uh, which occurred due to this twisting type injury, uh, mechanism of injury. Uh, um, so this is 2.13.13. Patient came back a couple of months later and we re rescanned it because he is an employee here. The bone edema had corrected, uh, which we see there. And we can see the, the fracture had healed itself. But I want to point this out because later on in uh, further lectures, we're going to talk about pathology in this particular location because it's commonly missed. And as we talked about earlier, this is not an area where you can see arthroscopically on standard arthroscopes. Uh, but we're going to talk about this far posterior disease. Uh, in this case, uh, injury to that area could be by, by a twisting injury. Most of the time, as we'll talk about, this is probably due to impaction injuries and in people who strain the knees, put a lot of pressure on it, and full flexion. And so what we'll find out later is this is a typical location where tennis players will get chondromalacia due to the repetitive trauma that you can get playing tennis. Let's see who's next? I think it's me. Okay. All right. So we have uh, lateral and frontal radiographs of the knee. I on the lateral it seems. Like, Oops. Shoot. I'm sorry. I just want to see something <laughs> here. I think. Yes. Yeah, these two, these go together. So, uh, okay. So, what do you see here? So, there is an ovoid low signal structure uh, in the posterior knee joint. Is it what the, the arrow sign is that showing us? What this shows here is a proximal ACL tear, where the ACL has been displaced a little bit thickened. Here we can see the ACL tear here. It should attach right up here. It's torn and displaced inferiorly. Now we can also see an injury to the lateral collateral ligament. So we'll talk about this later. This is, this is an ACL tear with a posterior lateral corner injury. We'll talk a lot about that. But I bring this up for another reason, and that is what do you see here on the x-rays? Uh, there is an effusion. Okay. And... Uh, the there is a osphabella, but it looks either I don't know. Is there a multipartite fabella? So there, uh, so. this actually turned out to be a fabella fracture. Okay. Because in the twisting injury, you got traction on the uh, uh, on the tendon, and uh, uh, 
that actually called displacement and a fracture transversely through the, the ossicle. Okay. And there you can see there the, the actually the two fragments. So this is a case where the fibella is patho pathologic and then it's fractured. Okay. So, okay, we got a radiograph at the top. We see anterior dislocation of the knee. Okay, so. Or posterior. I so, yes, posterior dislocation of the tibia and fibula yeah. with respect to the femur. Mm -hmm. and John, isn't that the way you like to describe these? It's the um, displacement. I of the do, tibia. but Campbell's doesn't always do that. Okay. I don't know. I don't know why they disagree with me. I mean, I know. Okay. <laughs> so, so but, but basically, just a little dry, a little dry humor. Yeah. Right. Uh, this is a posterior tibial dislocation, and uh, okay, and uh, it it needs to be reduced as quickly as possible, uh, and. Uh, and vascular studies will have to be done, obviously, because I'm, I, I'm sure that uh, major vessels have been injured here. Yeah. So you really need to look I at got, yeah, I was right. There you go. Right. Okay. Next case. Uh, so 21 year, year old female trauma 15 uh, days ago, there's a fracture of the medial tibial plateau. Uh, yeah, you can see that laterally, or sorry, immediately. Okay, so now this is three months later. What's happening to the bone? Uh, the bone marrow looks like decreased in signal, or There's increased in signal. Yeah. What is that? That'd be like osteopenia. Okay, and if we, if we, this is in January 4th, 2015, you bring a patient back, they over a year later, and it looks normal again. Mm -hmm. And this is called immobilization hyperemia. And it has this very funny worm-like appearance. And you'll see it uh, occasionally. This is acute, basically osteoporosis, from disuse osteoporosis. And you'll occasionally see it every now and then, but that's what it is, because it, it looks bizarre, but it's very specific, and there are very few other things that can look this way. Now, this patient had a... Ligament injury, does it? Uh, you have a, I forget the name of the tibial plateau fracture. Well, this is on the medial side. So this medial side, this would be associated with a posterior cruciate ligament tear. It was that's, on the lateral side. And there you can get a little fracture right here that we'll talk about, which is associated with anterior cruciate ligament tears. Uh, right. It's important with plain films, because if you see the little fracture here, then that makes a diagnosis that helps you know that you have ACL tear. With MR, we just see the injuries. So uh, I'm blocking on the name of the fracture. Anyway, you guys know it, right? Yes. Sagon. Sagon, yeah. Sagon fracture over here. and Sagon. Over here. Yeah, Sagon. Thank you. But in this patient, I don't know whether they had uh, a PCL tear or not. But good, good John. Here's a 24-year-old woman with uh, left knee pain and weakness. Uh, we can see here. Uh, what do you th what do you think of this, Tasty? All right, so we have a knee effusion. Yeah, so you know. And uh, back there, it looks here. like that's where it looks like kind of a vesicular yeah. appearing uh, structure it's, it's there. The structure right here. It's this structure right here. Kind of looks like a, a nerve. We go here. Okay, good. So that is a nerve, and it's a big thickened nerve. Yeah. What do you think about with thickened nerves? Um, some sort of nerve sheet tumor? It could be nerve sheet tumor. This looks like it goes all the way up and down. There are several things that can happen with nerves like this, but the most common one that we see is charcot tooth syndrome. Uh -huh. We'll talk about that later. There are not, we now know that there are multiple... Uh, gene variations which produce this, but you get uh, thickening of the peripheral nerves. And here you can see, here is hair. In the lumbar spine, it's uh, very obvious where you'll uh, typically get thickened 
uh, nerves coming out through the nerve roots uh, in the, in, and then the called equina. Uh, but some sarcoma tooth are primarily peripheral, some are more central, like in the spinal cord, uh, but we'll talk about the, uh, those later. Well, I guess we'll talk about a little bit here. So right now there are more than 80 genes uh, that can produce this. Uh, and it's fairly common. It's uh, one out of every two 2,500 people. So this is something that definitely you've already seen, or it's seen you before. And maybe you didn't see it, but you'll certainly see it uh, during the course of your year here, Sharpam tooth syndrome. And then, uh, and then there are a bunch of impingement syndromes within the knee that we'll talk about. Uh, uh, we'll talk about all of these insignificant ones as we go through. So there are many impingement syndromes. Uh, the more common ones that we're concerned about are Hoffa's fat pad impingement, suprapatellar fat pad we'll talk about, though I'm questioning the significance of that more and more. Suprapatellar plica, medial plica syndrome we've already talked about in the uh, Iliotibial band friction syndrome are the more common ones that we see clinically that are important. Okay.